Okay, welcome to Zoom the TBT with Charge and Hainer, sponsored by the Dunk Camp. Learn from the best dunkers in the world, Utah in late June. Info at www.thedunkcamp.com. We're proud to have Josh Brown, the content director for TBT, as our guest tonight. Josh, thanks for spending time with us tonight. Yeah, thank you guys. I, I, uh, I was telling you guys before we began, I'm a big fan of the show. Uh, I, I've kind of got a little bit of inside knowledge that you guys would be creating the show, so uh, no one's more excited than me. You guys are going to do a great job with it, so excited to be here. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you getting on. And uh, first off, congratulations to you and TBT hitting uh, the seventh year of existence. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. And, and you personally, I know you've been involved a little bit from day one uh, in some form or fashion with TB, so, TBT. So tell me how you got involved with TBT initially and how you ended up working with uh, TBT. Yeah, kind of a, a crazy story. Uh, I've kind of um, been able to see TBT through like a multitude of different um, lenses and kind of like position. So I began as a, a fan of TBT in 2014, me and my really good buddy, Mikey Cardozo from, from where I grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, we were the first fans at the TBT 2014 championship game, the inaugural TBT championship game between Team Barstool and the Notre Dame Fighting Alumni. So uh, him and I, we were just young college kids hanging out in Boston for the day. Then we showed up like four hours early to the game. Uh, we were like tweeting that we were outside. Dan Friel, who is the co-founder of TBT, came out, like gave us shirts, filmed us, made like a little video, um, tweeted at like the Barstool guys until we were there to watch. And then um, we had a great time at the game. And then the next year, TBT rolled around and then me and a different friend from college, David Krupnik, decided to put a team in TBT, the Jabroni Project. We didn't make it far. Uh, we lost right off the bat. Uh, we did have Tyshawn Taylor on our team, which was pretty cool, former Kansas Jayhawk and NBA guy. But um, it was kind of just a pet project. I don't think we knew how far we'd be able to take it. Uh, we ended up losing early. But uh, I, I loved TBT so much after seeing it in person the year before that I knew I, I had to be involved somehow again and on like a deeper level than just watching it so that's how I kind of just instinctively went like I'll create a team and then the year after that um I I, I was in college um I went to Northeastern University up in Boston and not to bore everyone but they do kind of like you take time off of school to do internships it's a really like detailed program and uh, I just randomly tweeted Dan Friel not even emailed him, didn't call him, just tweeted him, like, hey, I'd love to do an internship with TVT. Um, we ended up talking back and forth over DM. It happened. I did. Um, I ended up doing actually three years in a row of interning with them, and then uh, kind of I've been full-time with them now for like two and a half, three years now. Um, so kind of cool. Got to see TVT as a, a fan, a participant, and now um, a staff member, and uh, I don't think there's any other roles to go, so I think I'm, I'm kind of stuck here for now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good bridge into the next question. And I know you run the content, you're kind of director for TBT, so we were talking about that one of the things that makes it such a unique event is the fact that the access for fans is pretty big because a lot of these guys don't have the sort of entourage level or don't have the sort of NBA level of distance. It's, it's a really closer environment. So maybe explain a little bit what the content editor does for TBT and how much more fun it is to have that level of access as someone who does content. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of um, pros and cons, I would say, just to be honest about it. I'll start with the cons in that we're only a, a three-week event in the summer, um, and it, you lose access for a large portion of the year. Like, these guys will, they're happy to send in videos or do things with us if we want, but for 10, 11 months of the year, they're totally focused on their pro team, as they should be, because that's what they're getting paid to do. And sometimes guys are a little bit hesitant to interact with CBT and, um, and do things. So th there's actually times during the year where um, it, it has you like, I don't know, it has you even kind of like questioning yourself, like, what am I even doing? Like, you know, these guys are like, you know, there's nothing I can do for nine, 10 months a year. Um, and so we try to make the best of it as we can, but then it all leads into this two or three month time during the summertime, or not even probably one to two month period during the summertime where all these guys are thinking about is TBT, who they're going to add to their team, um, you know, playing, who their matchup's going to be, them being excited to play, them holding training camps with their different teams. And it, it kind of um, results in like a ton of content that comes out of it. So 
Um, it, it's kind of a, a, a twofold, you know, not a lot you could really do for a couple months of the year and then really just a wealth of stuff, really beginning kind of now during this April time frame and then going through the tournament. So uh, it's really fun. And then when you get on site, these guys are, are just amazing. They're willing to do anything, um, any kind of video or feature or long form, short form video podcast, anything you want to do with them, um, they're willing to do. So uh, it's kind of cool to look back every summer and just see like the, the different names that you've done stuff with guys who you remember watching in March Madness and over the years. So um, it, it's definitely from like April till August, there's probably no better job in America. Yeah, like you said, this is kind of the uh, the ramp up here to the TBT 2020. And I know as of last Saturday, uh, when I was looking and updating myself, we're already up to 77 plus teams. And I mean, we still got a lot of time left in the uh, application uh, period to go. So some really interesting teams forming uh, new teams like a Team Washington. You got some teams retooling like Iowa United and Florida TNT getting a lot of buzz. So who's uh, particularly catching your eye this year, whether they're a retooling team, really upgraded, or you know, just a new team that just really, you think there's going to be something special about them? Yeah, there's probably a bunch of them who are in formation right now as well. Like, I think we're all seeing Purdue talk a lot on social media. Based on what I'm hearing on them, they're going to be an amazing team. Uh, Oklahoma State, I think, is going to be underrated, a really good team, new addition team. They have Markel Brown on that team, Phil Ford. They, they remind me a lot of Marquette, the way that they've been built. Um, so I, I think they're going to surprise a lot of people, but I think the biggest improvement, and I think I tweeted it out, if you had to give an early GM of the year, it would be Terry Hughes from Florida TNT. Um, you know, they made a run last year to the second round. They ran into team Hines, which is a tough matchup to have to play early on in the tournament. But, uh, in addition to the guys they had on the team, like Devon and Cooper fell, um, uh, Chris Warren was a great name on that team. They've added, um, you know, Antonio Blagney, who is an NBA vet, played with the Chicago Bulls for a long time. Fletcher McGee, out of the clouds, an Orlando native, ended up signing with that team, his hometown team. A lot of those guys um, didn't even really know Fletcher, but just from watching him playing and know, knowing he's a, a Florida guy, brought him on. And, you know, he's the NCAA's all-time leader in three-point field goals. So um, you look at a team like that, they brought Rob Gray on as well, who played great for Team Fredette a year ago. So. Um, I look at them and, uh, you know, TBT is really a game of matchups. I think um, – I, I don't think there's ever one team that's really that much better than the pack. Like, I, even when overseas elite one, I think they had, like – they had that winning kind of, like – I don't even know the word from it, but just that kind of, like, winning piece that you need. And I think Carmen Spur had that as well. But just in terms of talent, I don't think either of those teams were that much more talented than any team they played. So – um, I think TBT is a game of matchups, but um, if Florida TNT can get the right one, they get the right matchup, it wouldn't surprise me if they made, you know, the semifinals, championship game, or even won. Yeah, I mean, the, the, some of these teams are low. We actually had Terry on the show, and, like, uh, him and Coach, uh, they were just the brainy. They just have a squad command. The Rob Gray Thanksgiving, the uh, horror shows, as a Memphis fan, Rob Gray tortured us his entire career. He just tortured us. And that goes to a key part of the fan base building because, like, you guys have a built-in engagement with a lot of the alumni teams. Uh, you guys are mentioned – you mentioned this, this monster Oklahoma State team coming in. Uh, I'm an Illinois grad student, so, like, the Illini coming yeah. in. It's going to be interesting. Uh, Purdue, Big Ten team coming in. The Iowa United, a blended team. How interesting – how different is it covering the teams that are united around a cause or around a region versus the alumni teams? Like, what is the difference as a content director dealing with the differences between the alumni – and the sort of blended or the sort of uh, cause teams, if you will? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, with the alumni teams, it's just a lot easier because anything you do, um, right, we're, we're in like an engagement business. Like, like you need to get, we need to get engagement. The NBA needs to get engagement. You know, every league out there, we're looking for engagement. So uh, with alumni teams, I think it's a lot easier. You can kind of put anything out there and the fans are going to eat it up. I think, um, you know, if we, if we just type you know, go if you know from the Carmen Spur account, if if they just typed like go Buckeyes, it would get 500 engagements on it right off the bat. So, um, I think with them, we can be a little bit more like player focused, just talking about who's going to play for them, um, what they did in college, kind of like 
that reuniting kind of aspect where with the cause team, um, you really have to tell those stories and get fans to like feel a personal connection with them. Like I know uh, Charge, um, you know, sideline cancer, he has like a personal connection to the cause that they're playing for. And that, that kind of touched him, the run that they made, they went on during the tournament. So I think with those uh, cause type teams or teams playing for a charity, it's all about telling that story, getting people to relate to the cause that they're playing for and kind of building a fandom that way with kind of a greater audience. Whereas um, with the alumni team, um, you know, we're not under any illusion that a fan of any other college basketball team is going to be rooting for Carmen's crew. So just focused on making sure they can kind of uh, connect with their alumni base where the cause teams, I think, were a little bit more broader looking at the whole um, kind of fandom landscape and, and trying to, um, you know, connect people who, who may have some sort of personal connection to the cause and, and kind of can relate to what they're playing for. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, segues nicely into one of the topics I want to talk about. Obviously, the alumni team has really accelerated uh, uh, the growth of the TBT. And you just mentioned about the engagement that they bring in. And, and you talked about some of the causes. And, and that's what I really love about TBT is, is some of the causes. They add a lot more character to the TBT that you may not get a, from an alumni team, some special moments that uh, – um, have really taken place across a number of the teams and a number of the causes. And I know you've worked really closely with uh, some of the, the teams that are playing for a, a cause. And I want to talk a little bit about ALS uh, specifically. I know uh, you've worked with them in the past, have a great backstory with them. And if you want to just talk about ALS, how they started um, at the beginning and obviously had some great success in, in your experience with them. Yeah, so um, ba basically Team Challenge ALS was started by Sean Marshall, who uh, attended Boston College. He was a basketball player. He was there when um, I grew up in Boston. I live in North Carolina now, but up in Boston, they were a big deal when he was up there. Now, not so much, but um, he was there kind of during the heyday of BC basketball. And he was roommates with Pete Frades, who um, everyone knows by now, unfortunately passed away uh, a couple months ago. But, um, you know, former BC baseball player, um, had a shot at, at, at a professional career after leaving college, whether it be in the minor leagues or overseas somewhere, um, unfortunately got ALS. And um, Sean made that team really, I think, three years ago. They played it as um, a, a team named Skinner Freight Train, which is a playoff of the old BC basketball coach. And then they turned into Team Challenge ALS beginning in 2017. And they played as that name ever since. So, um, Sean Marshall made that team to honor Pete. Um, you know, Pete, I think the kind of touching thing about it is that, um, when Pete was alive and was, he really was connected to that team. I mean, we got stories that he was watching every game. Um, Darren Collison coached that team, uh, the NBA, former NBA player retired now. And, um, there's a great picture of even at a Celtics game, Pete ended up meeting Darren Collison. So it's kind of formed like this family among guys who, you know, Sean Marshall obviously has a connection to Pete Brady's, but a lot of the other guys on the team didn't really have a connection to ALS. They were just playing because they, they, they know Sean. You know, it was a lot of guys from California where Sean grew up. Um, and then they all kind of really take into the cause. And you have really 12 guys now who kind of realize the magnitude of what they're playing for, even though a lot of them don't really have a connection to ALS or may not know anyone suffering from ALS. I, I think a couple others on the team do have a connection, but a lot of them don't. And um, they've just resulted in some great moments. One that comes to mind is um, Pete Brady's mom in the locker room of Team Challenge ALS before the 2017 championship game delivered uh, a really uh, kind of inspi inspiring speech to the team talking about what they were playing for, how much it meant to their family, uh, how much it meant to the ALS community. So um, just a lot of memorable moments. And I, I think um, they've kind of teased it out. They're going to be coming back with a really good roster this year. So uh, wouldn't shock me to see them back in the championship game either. Yeah, I mean, they always have a roster. And their plan for a cause makes it so much more interesting. Uh, the cause teams, the online teams, it makes such a rich tapestry of all these different things to involve yourselves with. And one thing that makes this such a great tournament for people who are involved, fans, uh, players alike, is that you guys are really open to new ideas, which goes to the idea of the Elam ending. And there's been a big change this year about how the ending is happening with the way that free throws in the game, that sort of thing. I wonder if you want to speak a little bit about the willingness of TB2 to evolve 
and how that's going to change the 2020 landscape a little bit. Yeah, I think um, the, the overall kind of like cool thing when you mentioned the Elam ending or whatever it be is that um, because we're really young and we're nimble and we're not, we're not the NCAA, we're not the NBA, we're not tied to like history or regulation, which is really the two things that are, it's kind of why you don't see sports adapt really quickly, right? Because the NBA has like a vast history. So if you change anything in the NBA game, well, then it changes history and how you measure history because, um, you know, the three-point stat is kind of, the three-point line is probably the biggest example. That changed um, basically everything about how you calculate stats in the NBA's history. Well, we don't really have to deal with any of that because we're so young and nimble and able to kind of change things as we see fit. So, um, you know, first of all, it's just bringing on the Elon ending and the willingness of um, John Mugar, our CEO, to, to embrace that and bring it aboard. And uh, it's obviously worked out really well. And then um, even within the Elon ending to adapt as we see fit, you know, we went from setting the target score from seven points to eight points last year. This year, we're going to be doing a new rule where um, in the Elam ending, uh, if a team is in the bonus, it's going to be one shot in the ball instead of two free throws. And that came as a result of fans not wanting games to end on free throws. Um, it's actually under 30% of games actually do end on a free throw, but um, both of our championship games ended on a free throw and the NBA All-Star game when they adopted the Elam ending for this year, that ended on a free throw. So um, while it wasn't a big percentage of games, it was um, a couple of meaningful games ended on free throw. So fans didn't want to see that anymore. So Nick Elam and John made this change where if you get fouled in the bonus during the Elam ending, it'll be one shot in the ball um, to take away that extra free throw and, and, you know, decrease the number of games that end like that. So, um, you know, I think all that is just to say that we, we can always adopt, uh, adapt on the fly and we always have adapted on the fly. And, uh, I think it's one of the more unique things about TBT is that we can really be kind of like a testing ground for all these ideas and, and see how they play out. And, um, you know, we've seen teams adopt them or leagues adopt them, whether it be the NBA adopting the Elam ending, the NCAA adopting the bracket celebration where teams go up and, and put their name on the bracket. So, um, you know, hopefully more of that to come. But that's kind of been, um, I think, one of the big selling points of TBT is our, our ability to, uh, to do that. You know, that Elam ending is fantastic. I've been in Columbus for the past couple of years, was able to see prime time make that uh, epic comeback and that Mid-American unity and uh, Red Scare last year. I, I was about to have a heart attack in that game. It just brings a whole new intensity uh, to game endings. Even games you think are out of reach seem like, you know, hey, they're coming back. One or two buckets and we're back in this thing. So it's amazing to watch. Um, so, so kind of, you talked about one of your memorable moments with, uh, ALS and, uh, just wanted to see, obviously you've been here from, uh, day one in 2014 as a fan all the way through, uh, last season, other memorable TBT moments, whether on the court or off the court, things that just really have stood with you over the past, uh, six years. Yeah. When you think about on the court, there's, there's so many of them that they end up kind of blending together after a while, whether it be Carmen crew beating overseas elite, whether it be, um, both in 2018 and 2019, Travis Diener hitting like crazy Elam ending threes to win and his team mobbing him and Dwayne Wade watching on TV and being all over it. Um, Charge, you mentioned the primetime players comeback. That was a great TBT moment to, to uh, see in person. So I think on the court, there's so many of them that it's hard to, hard to nail it down. I mean, Jimmer Fredette going for 41 against the Fort Wayne champs in 2018, I think it was. Um, and like the internet's reaction to that, that was a great TBT moment. Um, the overseas elite Louisiana United game, uh, we all thought overseas elite yeah, was going to lose fair. that game. And then Jeremy Pargo gets fouled, gets the free throw, they end up winning. Um, and it was a good foul call for anyone who, who doesn't think it was. Um, so there's so many of them that it's hard to pick one. I think, um, there's, I think what, what kind of sticks out to me is all the memorable moments off the court. Um, and I'll, you know what, I'll tell you one, and it might get me in trouble for saying it, but I think I'll be able to get out of it is this is only a moment that I saw. So I'm kind of giving you guys uh, a little bit of a scoop here, but at, in, at the, in the, during halftime of the TBT 2017 championship game between overseas elite and team challenge ALS, 
they had to, the way they walked off the court, um, they, they basically walked off opposite sides of where they were supposed to. So they were in the back in the tunnel and they had to cross each other to get to the locker room. And they started talking with each other. And it, for a minute, it got a little bit tense. I thought something was going to end up happening. Like they were in each other's faces a little bit. Um, Austin Day was in the middle of it. Um, DeAndre Kane, I think, was in the middle of it. And they were like jawing back and forth. There was never too much physical contact, maybe like a little, you know, um, shoulder to shoulder or whatever. Nothing too bad. But um, for a minute, it looked like something was going to break out between the two teams in the tunnel during the TBT 27 championship game. And, you know, we laugh about it now. Those are kind of, when you're running an event, always like a worst case scenario is two teams fighting and then in the hall, in the uh, tunnel at halftime of the championship game. But there's a lot of moments like that. And um, just talking to the guys and getting to know them and, um, you know, spend some time with guys like Travis Diener. And um, there's just so many guys I could rattle off that you kind of grew up watching or, or knowing about. So then, be able to talk to them in hotels or at the arena and get to know them. Um, I think that's kind of all the stuff that, that ends up sticking with you. Yeah, that's a great story. I, I can't imagine being between Kane and Dane and being like, that's going to go down. That's going to be nuts. <laughs> uh, that's a bit of color. Good point, good point to end this. Uh, Josh, we really appreciate the time. We're definitely going to have you back on. This is a great conversation. We can't wait to have you back on. Uh, thanks for taking the time tonight. Yeah, thank you, guys. Happy to uh, come back okay. anytime. Zoom the TVT with uh, Josh Brown, content director for TVT. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thanks,